Can you dim those lights, Carlos? They're right in my eyes. I can't see Uncle Bob. <laughs> Look at that. It's just like normal. I get up on the stage and everybody quiets right down. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thanks to the people that have come from a long ways and everybody else that just came from Airdrie. Um, yeah, it's... Uh, um, yeah, it's a bit of a sad time, but we want to try and keep it light and, and, and have a lot of fun with this. Um, Dad, I don't think, would have wanted us all mourning and sappy and sorry and everything. He lived a really good life, and uh, so we're just here to, today to celebrate his life and remember him. Um, you know, he was very active in all of those types of things. Uh, I'd like to thank the Polaris staff, Carlos and, and, and his staff, um, for allowing us to enjoy this venue. It's, uh, it's a really great venue. He got this podium all done for us and the stairs and everything. He's been amazing and very helpful. Uh, McInnes and Holloway as well. Their people have come and helped us and been very supportive through this whole thing at the beginning. So we just want to thank them as well because um you know it, it's a lot of work and and these people really know how to step in and support people through this kind of stuff i'm as most of you know not soft and fuzzy so it's kind of nice that these people are and they help us out to be a little kinder and gentler so um <laughs> uh there's some stuff we've got some food and snacks and there's drinks out there coffee tea um all that kind of pop and juice there's some alcoholic beverages if you feel the need to snap back a few um wes maybe you can mind your business for a bit but uh <laughs> anyhow uh, i'm just very grateful that i had my dad in my life as long as i did um and uh we'll get into that in a little bit i don't know if anybody noticed his name up in the marquee there when you come in i think everybody would agree that dad would have loved that you know he always liked being the star so we got him up in the marquee and i think he would have really enjoyed that um so anyhow we're going to get into this here fairly quickly and um i'd like to invite up my daughter-in-law christy and she's going to say a little prayer to get things started and uh yeah and then we'll we'll move on do we clap for christy look at her anyway Christy's quite shy. She doesn't. She doesn't like doing this. But we talked her into it. Dad would get her up somehow. Yes, Bill always wanted me to speak at everything, and I graciously said no every single time. So, of course, he has me speaking twice today. So, <laughs> um, John sixteen twenty two. So with you now. Now is your time of grief. But I will see you again. I will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. I'd just like to pray for peace around this room as we honor a devoted husband, a strong father, a respected grandfather, a present great-grandfather, a hard worker, a passionate public servant, and a wise friend. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Christy. That was perfect. I mentioned maybe we could keep it fairly short, and she, she did a very good job. <laughs> So thank you. Um, I'd like to invite up now my son, Kirk. Uh, he's going to do the eulogy today. Kirk gets no clapping. <laughs> um, usually I just kind of wing these things, but... Uh, given some good advice today and told to write this down so <laughs> um so today i do have the honor of speaking to you about william forrest better known to many as bill or to me grandpa um grandpa was born september 20th 1932 in Carndiff, saskatchewan was the son of peter and alice and brother to les ellen eileen bob pete and pat 
husband to Dorothy, or Dot, and the father of five children, seven grandchildren, and nine great-grandchildren. <clears throat> it was a long life uh, and a full life. 91 years until the very end, Grandpa lived that life the way he saw best. Um, he remained independent, living in the same house where he and Grandma lived after moving to Airdrie. Uh, that was maybe despite some people trying to tell him otherwise. <laughs> he continued to cook and take care of the house after, um, after Grandma passed, as I said, and he would maintain the garden, mow his own lawn, and even just 10 days before he passed, he was out traveling his own walk. These are all things he didn't have to do. He was in a 55-plus community. They would do that for you. <clears throat> um, I would go as far as to say as he went out on his own terms, and uh, hopefully we could all be so fortunate. Although it's very hard to say goodbye to my grandpa, I know he is now at peace with grandma. So we are here today to remember the life and legacy he leaves on this earth. And when I was preparing this speech, I did want to write it more as a celebration of life and reflect on my grandpa's influence on me. Um, I know there was obviously a lot more to his life than that, but this is the way that I remember and see him. So um, I was very fortunate when my grandparents moved from Burnaby, B.C. to Airdrie. Um, grandma and Grandpa would watch me and my younger sister, Hillary, after school. Um, Lots of family dinners, I recall being there, and uh, Grandpa having to put in a little bell so Grandma would be able to be in the kitchen and ring us up and come up from downstairs in the computer room. Um, the computer room, i got to mention that. You know, Grandpa was always keeping up with the latest technology. Even recently, I inherited some brand-new Bluetooth headsets I don't think were ever used, so... Um, he always had to have new, the newest computer stuff, and don't forget your antivirus software. There was a lot of change that Grandpa saw since the 1920s, and he was not one to be left behind. Um, before they moved from BC, uh, me and my sister would often visit Grandma and Grandpa at their apartment in Burnaby, where I still remember the car alarms honking late at night, swimming at the pool with Grandma and tracking through the bush scavenging for berries, listening for bears, as well as trying to find the right streams to pull a little rainbow trout from. Grandpa loved fishing. I think there was a good number of photos to prove that. Um, I got to join a few fishing trips myself, um, and I know a lot of those fishing trips are great memories that everybody in the family shares with Grandpa. Uh, one trip I do remember in particular, it was to tackle a lake in remote northern BC, for those of you who haven't heard of it, you're not alone. Um, Grandpa planned the whole thing, including the fact that we had to drive there over two days and stop in Prince George. And uh, we stayed the night at my aunt and uncle's, and they were gone. I think you guys were maybe on vacation or something like that, and uh, that was fine. We were going to let ourselves in, spend the night, leave the next morning. But there was explicit instructions to not let the cat out. Jeremy, you might remember this, because it's burned in my memory. The cat got out, of course. <laughs> and he went straight across the backyard, and there was a forest out back. And Jeremy looked like a true athlete that day. Like, he was right on that cat's tail, and he went over the fence in one clean hop. Unsuccessfully found the cat, though. Now, Grandpa was a cat guy himself, so we were all pretty worked up over it. It was an ordeal over the night. I really don't even think we found the cat before we left, and then the cat had to just wait until they got home the next day. So we carried on our way though to the fishing trip. That was that was the end goal. <clears throat> um, that trip, the fishing wasn't actually great either. Um, we caught a few small fish that were thrown back in, um, and it wasn't until the last night or or the second last night we were on our way back into shore, and Grandpa just threw his line out randomly and like hooked a fish by the top of its head coming back into shore and sure enough he caught the biggest fish out of everybody. That was also the same uh, same trip where I think I had my first cup of coffee um, and I was told well put the sugar in get the caffeine rush and the sugar rush. So many people here today know of grandpa's career in construction as a superintendent 
his fierce opinion on politics, and his nearly 55 years of sobriety. The commonality I see in all of these three things is they're extremely hard. Um, during his life, Grandpa worked across much of Canada, working on different projects, seeing the politics in the different provinces, and impacting so many different people in these communities. You see that today by the number of people in this room, uh, as well as by all the well wishes that were sent for those who couldn't make it. <clears throat> um, in all these different places, Grandpa needed to be busy. Um, whether it was attending AA meetings over the last 55 years, hosting the Conservative Party at his house for policy discussions, walking laps at the Genesis track, or helping those who needed it, he was still never shy to provide his opinion. Sometimes whether you liked it or not. This may be a trait he passed down to many of the forests. Originally I had wrote it in there myself, but I needed to include the larger group. Regardless, it wasn't only buildings Grandpa built. It was his legacy and reputation, and one that now speaks for itself. <clears throat> one thing I also hope to inherit from Grandpa is his ability to be a loving husband, father, brother, uncle, and maybe one day for myself a grandfather. I know there is a conception of Grandpa that he is maybe a little surly and tough. Certainly don't look for too many compliments or a hug. But my grandparents were married for 65 years, and when my grandma's arthritis mobilized her, we did get to see a softer side of grandpa as we watched him take care of her. He did the things she was unable to do while never slowing in his own daily routine. Um, he was a man who moved to be closer to his family, a trait that has rubbed off on his oldest son, my uncle Peter, and he is a father and a grandfather, all love, and are here today to remember. He was a man with wild eyebrows, half an ear, and quick to help a stranger. <laughs> Later in my life, Grandpa took me under his wing again, um, and I worked for him in his construction management company. Uh, we got to work on a couple of custom projects together, um, and I was able to learn both the hands-on aspects of the business as well as the business side. Uh, while working for him, I had a little incident on site, and that was when Grandpa was quick to say, well then, go to school. Um, <clears throat> after graduating, he pointed me towards Maple Rinders, the same company he worked for in Calgary many moons ago, and I still work for 11 years later. Uh, it was something him and I always had in common and we would talk about during our many visits, so I need to thank you, Grandpa. Truly, I don't think I would be who I am today without your guidance. Well, I'm sure Grandpa would enjoy all this talk about how much I love and miss him. He was never someone who appreciated the overly sentimental. Nor did he often use the words, I loved you. He showed it in other ways with his actions. I remember Grandma telling me one day, he doesn't say I love you, but he puts my winter tires on in a snowstorm. <laughs> Much like Grandpa, after we hear some more stories from those of you here today, um, share some laughter and some tears, we need to go and uh, enjoy each other's company um, and enjoy ourselves. That would be what Grandpa would want us to see or be doing um, and be doing something useful. So please join us after the service concludes for food, as Dad said, in the room next door. And thank you, everyone, for coming today. Okay, thank you, Kirk. That was great. Uh, yeah, lots of, lots of memories that I had kind of forgotten about a little bit, so... Um, yeah, uh, uh, so we're kind of going to go through a few different people coming up and saying a few words about dad and, um, I always seem to get elected to do this part of things, so I'm deciding the way that we're going to do the order, so I'm going to go first and, uh, the rest of you, sorry for your luck. Um, so anyhow, um, I... I I was going through, a, a, as Kirk mentioned, you know, Dad never really said he loved us too much or any of that kind of things, but it was the way that he showed his love and by being there when you needed him most. And I was going through a really rough time, um, and uh, Dad had moved into Airdrie, I think about 2000, and about 2006, um, my son Kirk had called him and, and said, you know, Dad's 
kind of losing his mind. Can you come over? And, and he came over and he helped me to realize that I had a bit more of a problem than I, what I knew. And, and uh, so he took me back to mom and dad's and, and, and uh, sat there and talked to me for a while. But it was seeming that he wasn't really getting through to me, I guess, in his mind. I don't know. But he called a friend of his out from Calgary. And, and this gentleman sat down with me for many hours that afternoon. And... and um, we uh, we decided that I needed to to change the path that I was going in, and so I went with this gentleman, and I've since kind of changed my path, and and uh, my life has gotten a lot better. So for me, you know, that show of love that day, I'll never forget that. In and uh, you know, I used to always get my dad to give me a card or whatever, and whenever. I would be standing up there, I would always make sure I gave Dad a hug because that was one of his, you could feel him cringing when you hugged him. It was like, oh my God, why are you touching me? And it was like, because you're my dad. And um, so for me, you know, that that's one of the the memories that I will, will never forget about my dad, how he helped me. You know, there's so many more, like, uh, honestly, you know, when I was growing up younger and, and I was getting involved in the carpentry trade and, you know, I was kind of following dad's footsteps and that. And I had a bit of a resentment, you might say, because my dad, I was young and so I had to go to all these roundups and different shit and, and I didn't enjoy that too much. Maybe because I had a bit of a problem myself, I don't really know, but um, so, you know, I never really liked to spend too much time with dad when I was younger and lo and behold I ended up working with him quite a bit like Kirk and, and uh, I can remember fighting with him a lot, you know, we would be arguing quite a bit and, and honestly after 2006 I don't remember too many harsh words between him and I and um, so you know that part of things for me in my life, um, you know, it, it was the way he lived his life that has allowed me to to start to learn that and live my life a different way. And, and, you know, you can tell by all the people that are here that came up today when we were standing in the line and how many people he helped and, you know, so many people that called and, and you know, were saying that they couldn't make it today but how sorry they were here of him passing and everything. And, you know, um, when we were sitting in the hospital with him, I, got, I went in Wednesday night, he was in the, the emergency, I've told m quite a few people, but you know, when he was sitting in there and I was talking with dad and you know, the nurses were coming around and everything and, and we were talking about him getting out on Monday and, and dad didn't get out Monday. That was really tough for me because I thought he'd be coming home. And it's good that he didn't come home because he would have been miserable if he would have come home. So, you know, I, I feel like God works in mysterious ways. And, and for Dad, you know, I think he, he rallied. Uh, he kind of went downhill Thursday and Friday a little bit. My sister showed up Friday. And, and he kind of perked up a little bit when she got there. And um, Saturday, he was kind of back to him, himself, and I thought, perfect, we're going to be getting out of here Monday. <laughs> and um, and it was just like he perked up so he could see people. And and Saturday and Sunday, he got to to visit with a lot of different people, you know, my daughter and, and Kirk and, and my side. as My kids came in and Peter's, and, you know, there was a lot of people that came through and visited with him. And, um, you know, his thrill was that Angela came up and seen him. And I thank her for that because, I don't know, you know, I'm not a, I'm sorry to say, but I'm not a politician type person and I really have no use for politics or, <laughs> or politicians in general, but this, and I don't mean that rudely towards you, Angela, but <laughs> this woman helped Dad, and, and she gave Dad a purpose. And, you know, he was, 
he was so excited, he took her to the Christmas party at the Seniors Lodge, and he had a date, and it was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Like, this woman is, I don't know how old she is, doesn't matter, but like, he's 91, and he's taking her on a date, and it's like, well, and, they, and he loved it, you know, it was great, and he talked about it and everything, but again, thank you, Angela, for being there for Dad and coming that Sunday, and we just all got up and left, because there was no point in talking to Dad when Angela was around, like, oh my God, Angela's here, we, we might as well leave, and so we did, we left, and, and she spent the afternoon there, as far as I know, and he was happier than pig and shit, and <laughs> yeah, so anyhow, um, uh, it was just amazing the way that he rallied for the weekend and, and then basically come Monday he started to to turn again and he was he was really not very happy and, and about being in there and he'd ripped the catheter out. I don't know if anybody's ever thought of doing that, but to me that's gotta be an awful painful thing, so I wouldn't advise it. But uh Yeah, and uh he wouldn't keep the oxygen on and finally we just finally said, you know what? Just, just let him do what he wants, and 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 he did, and he slowly went down, and you know, he would wake up and say, "Come on, let's get out of here, let's go," you know, and things like that, and so he was always still right there, ready, you know, strong, and thought that he could do anything, and and that's kind of the way I'll always remember him, is that he, he was always, you know, I hope that I can be that way, just able to keep working and doing things. Unfortunately for me, I've kind of got the arthritis side of things from mom, and so my knees are not doing great and stuff, but, you know, I try not to snivel too much about it unless Ute is around, because she tends to give me, well, she's German, so she don't listen too well about that kind of stuff. She gives me grief, so, yeah. I don't know if any have been, anyhow, we're not going to get into that, but... I'll get in trouble later for that one. I can tell you that right now. But uh, I tried to get her to come up here, but she's not much of a speaker. She won't ever do any of this kind of stuff. But she's here with her family, and I'd like to thank Stephen and Rebecca and Justin all for coming as well. You know, they've been a big part of my life. But, um, yeah, I'm, I, I get up here and I get rambling, as most of you know, and uh, I should probably stop rambling and let somebody else get up here, but... You know, I, I, I'm i really sad that Dad's gone. I try not to show it too much in some ways because I don't think that that's how I, you know, Dad, he was never like that. and and But he did show us many ways that he loved us and stuff. So um, just on a lighter note, you don't need seven credit cards. Your kids have to cancel those credit cards. They're very hard to cancel. So <laughs> if you're getting older, consider some of these things. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm going to ask Mark if he wants to come up and say something, and we'll just carry on. And uh, there's a few other people, so I won't take too much more time up. Thank you very much. Well, what can I say about my dad? He was a great man. I do remember the 1950s, believe it or not, even though I was born in 1956. Now, what I remember specifically about the 1950s is December 31st for two reasons. First of all, it was New Year's, so it was going to be 1960. Number two, December 31st is my birthday. And as well, I was born at about... I think it was quarter after eight, so pretty close. We were able to stay up, even though I was, you know, just becoming four years old, we were able to stay up. I remember this very distinctly, because as it got to be toward 12 o'clock, I decided to do what I normally did. I rolled into a ball and stuck my head into the couch. My mom thought this was really funny, so she up and smacked me on the ass. Of course, then the waterworks started and the screaming and the crying. And I screamed and I cried all through Old Lang Syne, 1960. <laughs> so that's the first thing I remember. And of course, my dad probably wouldn't remember too much of that because there was a lot of his buddies around and a bunch of his brothers as well. Moving forward, dad 
did some really, really cool and interesting things and had a great mind in some ways. We always used to watch cowboys and Indians, and I love the Indian headdresses. So dad, he got onto mom's sewing machine. Again, this is an instrument from the 1950s, so you know, not too much finesse there. But he got out a bunch of liners for shirts. And he had been hunting, so he'd been collecting feathers. And he started sewing these feathers in between two shirt liners, enough to create an Indian headdress. Now here's the other part, is that an Indian headdress has all of that stuff in there, all of that, that animal stuff to, to keep the feathers up and whatnot. So when I put this thing on my head, of course the feathers just fell down and it just flew around, so that was that, and there you go. So moving forward from there, I asked for a guitar for Christmas, okay? I'm thinking Jimi Hendrix, thank you, they buy me an acoustic guitar, not Joni Mitchell. I play the drums, thanks for that. <laughs> However, before I got into the drums, dad, for a show and tell day at the end of the school year in Grinrod, he actually took a piece of plywood and he cut this piece of plywood into the shape of a guitar. The headstock on the guitar was like a Gibson flying V. Now maybe a lot of you don't know what a flying V looks like or the headstock looks like, but it's only one of the Gibson guitars that has that V shape on the headstock. Now I know, I know that he did not know that headstock was on that guitar. So he pounded some nails into the back of the guitar, into the butt, to put the strings on. Then he had some screws. Now these were just normal screws, everyday screws, but of course you have to use a slot head screw because you're gonna take the fishing wire and you're gonna put it through the slot on the head of the screw, and then you still got enough to be able to tighten it down and kind of semi-tune this guitar. Well, it was really, really cool. I was a hit at school, for once. <laughs> now, I needed glasses, you know, when I got out of the hospital in the summer of 1963. Didn't get glasses for many, many years, so, you know, I, I missed out on a heck of a lot of school. Became dyslexic as hell with the shit they fed me in the hospital. But anyways, onward and forward from that. I did get glasses. I spent an awful lot of time helping my dad construct things. I was the one that would hold the board. He would be the one that would saw the board. My dad never said a word to me while we were doing this. I never said a word to him. We didn't have to. We were father and son. That's just the way we were. And that's just the way it was. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Good memories. Um, so, yeah, we're going to get Carrie to come up now and say a few words. And I don't know, uh, is Braden and Isaac coming up? No. Tried to talk them into it. but Hello to you all. Uh, my name is Carrie, not Karen, as my ex-husband would have you believe. Um, <laughs> that's what he called me today. A little insider joke. Um, anyways, uh, <coughs> this is a sad, sad day for me. Uh, I feel much the same way that Doug feels. It's, uh, it's sad, but I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I would have preferred the other side of it in, in that dad would have come home and things would have been different for him. Um, I always really, really love my dad. I am the youngest of five children. I am the only girl and just for you, Mark, I am his favorite daughter. Um, <laughs> and, you know, um, I, I'm not going to stand beside you or in front of you today and tell you that Dad was all warm and fuzzy and lovey and stuff, or you'd be like, Jesus, I've come to the wrong service, and you'll leave <laughs> if you knew him. Um, but he, he, you know, he was a good man, and he, and he showed love in so many different ways. And I remember when I was younger and more... Um, you know, what's the word, idealistic about love and life and, and marriage. And I would watch the dance that my mom and dad did and, and I would just think, what is with this guy? Like, because mom always made the tea and she always carried the tea to the table and then she poured the tea. And then interestingly enough, he would drink his tea and then just slightly push it towards her and she would pour another cup. 
And as I got older, I would think, oh my goodness, like what is with that? How can you put up with that? And she would say, that's just the way he is. But again, I was young and, and idealistic about what a marriage and a relationship was. And then my mom got sick and I, I, I watched my dad tirelessly take care of her. And um, you know, really my mom should have been in hospice, but he wouldn't allow that. And, and, and he, he cared for her and my dad was a gruff kind of a guy and not warm and fuzzy and he certainly wasn't into changing diapers and helping transfer people, but that's, that's the role that he took on. And, um, you know, I, I really saw that love shine and I, I really learned in that moment that that, that, is, that is the dance of life. And sometimes when you're married or in, in a relationship, it will feel like you're giving more and, 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 and you're on the underbelly of the relationship and, and whomever you're married to might seem like they're on a free ride, but you just never know where that's gonna flip over. And, and that free ride, now they're taking care of you. And mom and dad taught me that, 65 years of marriage. And um, you know, as you can see by all the family here, and you know, I'm, I'm making fun of my ex-husband today, but he, he is here, he is in this audience, as well as Doug's ex-wife, and, and those are the family values that, that my mom and dad installed in us, is just that family is forever and always, and you stick together no matter what. And, um, you know, uh, we had a good life. We used to always go fishing, and dad had this, um, really old Jimmy truck I remember driving in and um, we'd all load up and, and we'd, we'd go and find a stream, but couldn't, you know, the first stream you found wasn't good enough. You had to drive by 50 of them and hang on to a cliff and nearly die to get to the perfect, perfect one. And, he, and he'd be fishing and, and he'd bring Doug and I and I, I don't know why he brought us because uh, we would just play in the water and disturb the fish. And uh, this one day we were out there and we are we're, we're we're playing by, by the side of the stream and, and uh, I looked down and there was this big snake all coiled up sleeping and oh my God, and I'm afraid of snakes and uh, I was just a screaming terrified. and yeah, terrified, that's a better word. And um, <laughs> anyways, my dad came through the bush running like a Kenyan, you should have seen him. And uh, we had this old dog, Chummy. He was a German Shepherd Corgi. So he looked like a German Shepherd with legs about that long. And he got a hold of this snake and he was biting it and frothing at the uh, mouth. And Dad smacked it on the head with a shovel. That poor snake was probably like, Jesus, just trying to rest here. <laughs> but by the time we were done with him and Chummy threw him in the water, he was more than dead. And it was a good day. Doug and I talk about that all the time. It was a funny day. Um, but as I grew up, you know, Dad was always, we, we always had people coming into our house and, and adoptees that dad would take care of. And if not that, he'd be getting up in the middle of the night because somebody he was sponsoring didn't have a pack of smokes and he'd take them a pack of smokes. And again, I was young and idealistic and I just used to think, my God, if they can't afford a pack of smokes, it's so sad for them, too bad, but oh no. He, he, he would get up and he would take them the pack of smokes. And I've seen many people sit around our kitchen table in our life and, and it's just, again, really taught me that I, I, I'm really just never too busy to help somebody and, and lend a helping hand. And, um, you know, um, I just, I really just can't say enough good things about the man that dad was. And as dad, Doug has said, like when he was in the hospital, he was still like, he, he, we were losing him, but he was still just sharp as a tack in so many ways. Like Doug had said, oh, well, um, I'm going to use his, his debit card to pay, pay his bills while, while we're waiting for him to get out of the hospital. And uh, at this point, Dad was not responsive and he hadn't been talking to us all day. And I said, well, you're gonna need um, the pin to his card there, Einstein. And he's like, oh yeah, good one. And he says, oh, I should have asked him while he was still alert. And I said, well, ask him now, see what he says. So Doug went over and whispered in his ear. He goes, hey, Dad, do you know the pin to your bank card? 1909, bang. <laughs> Just like that, just pop that right off. And uh, it, was, it was just so funny. And then about an hour later, he calls me over and I, I'd been there with him for, 
for a week and I stayed with him in the night because he just hated being in the hospital. He wanted me to keep an eye on those bastards so they didn't get up to anything while he was sleeping. <laughs> and uh, he really believed that they were feeding him booze and all oh, the stories were endless, I tell you. Um, but uh, he, he, which by the way, Doug, you didn't ever do this. But anyways, he, uh, he wanted, he said, you know what, I, I need you to get that bank card from Doug and and go get yourself a hundred dollars and put it in your pocket. And I said, well, "What do I need a hundred dollars for?" And he goes, "Well, you just you just need that money. You just keep it in your pocket." 1909, and that's the last word I ever heard my dad say. And lucky Doug, he's a Montreal Canadiens fan, and he lives and breathes them. He'd marry one if he could. And um, <laughs> and what is the year that the Montreal Canadiens were formed? It's 1909. That's right. That's right. So it's just kind of a a funny little story. Um, so in, in closing, I, I would be remiss to not thank a very special lady here this evening. And, and her name is Angela Pitt. And she, you know, my dad, he was married for 65 years. And can you imagine to have somebody in your life for 65 years and you walk that dance of stopping drinking, the loss of a business, the loss of a house, five children, losing a son, and you live through all of that and then you lose your spouse. And he lost his eyesight and his driver's license and he, he recreated himself and he learned to live by himself for five years in that house, really not being able to see or hear. And, um, and he did it and he did a pretty good job. He had some bad behavior though, you know, he still's on the ladder till the day he died. It was just painful for us all. But, um, but Angela, um, you know, she gave him a purpose, and, and he would go door to door canvassing with her, and, and uh, he would host conservative party meetings and go to conservative party meetings, and I think that she let him feel like a little bit bigger of a deal than he really was, but he was pretty proud of that, and he used to always tell me what a big deal she was, and yeah, yeah, I will really miss those calls from dad. I, my phone would ring, and I'd answer it, and he'd say, oh, hi, it's your dad. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm aware, dad. <laughs> I know your voice. And they would tell me some story about something he'd been doing with Angela and how important she was and people needed to know Angela. And uh, so thank you, Angela, for, for really being a big part of, of the last five years we got to spend with Dad. And I also would like to thank um, my brothers Peter and Doug. Um, I don't live in Airdrie. And, uh, and my other brother, Mark, lives in Prince George. So we weren't able to be here to take care of Dad. And, and Doug and, and Peter spent tireless hours taking Dad to the gym. Peter took him to the gym and his many, many outings to buy this, that, and every other thing. And oh, he was just painful when he wanted to go get something because you had to get the milk at Walmart and the bird seed at Canadian Tire. And you got to go way across town to the superstore to get a loaf, or a loaf of bread and the lettuce was at the Coopers and holy cow. Just because he was saving money and meanwhile he'd burn a tank of their gas. <laughs> And that's so um, I think in closing I will um, I'll leave you with some advice that dad used to always say to me and um, I have a, a little I guess he would be my great nephew Bennett he's just a little fella and he's just cute as can be and if you send him any love he catches it and he just tucks it in his little heart and I would call dad and, and I, I would you know I'd have some catastrophic life problem that I would talk to him about and I'd pour my heart out and I'd be crying and, you know, I never got, oh, that, that's really sad, you know, it must be hard or anything. I, it was this, well, it would just seem to me that God hasn't let you down yet and I don't think he's going to start today, so just remember that. Have a good day. And that's what he would say to me. <laughs> but, you know, I carry that with me and when I'm in certain places and I just, I feel like life is getting to be too much, I, I think of that and it's, um, it's some really good advice. So if we could all just be like little Ben and just tuck that in our hearts. So thank you so much for coming, everybody. And um, yeah, that's it. I will turn this back over to Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. That was really good. Um, so we've been talking a little bit about Angela. So I think... We were going to try and get more of the family, but as I said at the start of this, this is 
kind of my show, so I'm going to decide who's coming up. And Angela, I'd like you to come up and say a few words so that everybody can see who you actually are. I think um, Bill maybe made me out to be a bigger deal than I am. <laughs> but uh, it's <laughs> hard to be here. But we're going to keep this light because it's Bill's celebration. Um, and it's my honor truly to have ever met Bill Forrest. Uh, he was a man who had a very clear view on life. Uh, his own, <laughs> and that of others. Uh, I, I first met Bill in 2015 uh, on a campaign that was crazy, and he quickly became a friend and a very important part of my personal life and my professional life. He played a pivotal role in Alberta's history as a key door knocker in a few campaigns, policy maker. He served as the VP of policy on our constituency association. He was a member at large for many years, and he was a key part of our Woodside seniors strategy. I'm sure some of you are here. He made sure his neighbors were aware of where and how to vote, and most definitely who to vote for. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> Um, when we would find opposition, uh, an opposition voter at the doors, he would firmly and with all of his honesty explain to them why they were wrong and making a mistake <laughs> and that they needed to do a better job for the future of their children. <laughs> no one ever fought back against him. It was absolutely wild to me. Bill was very passionate about seniors and veterans and getting youth involved in our movement. We used to make fun, um, joke a little bit and call him our VP of youth. Um, Bill, of course, always being the oldest member of our constituency association, um, but he had the passion that could match any of those that we consider youth. He pushed forward important policies uh, like addiction treatment, forest management, red tape reduction in construction, and many more. And as has been made very clear, Bill was never short on ideas and letting you know that he had them. Uh, he recently had a meeting with the Minister of Forestry and Parks uh, to share some of his ideas. And we were looking to schedule one more with the Minister of Mental Health and Addiction uh, for some cool stuff that he was really passionate about. Bill was so proud of his family and the accomplishments of his kids. He really didn't shut up about you guys. <laughs> In fact, um, when I was at the hospital, on the Sunday, which was a great honor. Um, the nurse came in and Bill was almost selling you guys like you were single and the nurse was going to date you. He says, these kids are a really big deal and everybody is, you know, sought after these guys and wants me to work for them or wants them to work for them. Um, and Kirk, he definitely, I don't know where you are, but Kirk, he definitely took credit for you getting your job. <laughs> <laughs> You guys meant a lot to him, and uh, he was very good at taking care of his wife, Dot, and uh, made sure that uh, him and Dot and I had lots of visits um, because she couldn't move so well, so we went, and uh, those were, it was a really special time. Bill was always very thoughtful of others, of course. Uh, when the war in Ukraine broke out, he phoned me right away, and he says, I have this suite in my basement and it's empty and it's just sitting there and I would I would like you know some refugees to come and stay in my basement I can't imagine what his family thought of a 90 year old man <laughs> living alone taking in strangers into his home but it actually didn't take long for an opportunity uh, to arise where Bill took every opportunity to make sure that he was helping uh, Ukrainian refugees. And my understanding is that uh, Bill's family and Bill's children have actually um, helped many Ukrainian refugees uh, settle here in Alberta. And I'm pretty sure Bill, Bill made sure that uh, they were UCP supporters when <laughs> they became citizens. Uh, Bill would have been 55 years sober this year. He helped so many people 
uh, in his home uh, over the years, holding AA meetings in his house up until COVID broke out. Bill called it COVID, by the way. Um, <laughs> I never corrected him because I thought it was funny. Um, I also thought he wouldn't care. <laughs> Bill had a green thumb, a really, really good one. At least I thought so. I learned a lot about gardening from him. Uh, a few times a year, Bill would give me a garden tour and the progression of where it started and where it was. And when I finally got a bigger space of my own to uh, have a garden, Bill came and taught me a few things. He'd bring a few plants every year uh, to help me out. And when they took his driver's license away, he was devastated, of course. As we know, Bill is very, very, very independent. He found ways around that, uh, but he started growing Swiss chard in his garden because he knew it would help his eyesight, and it did for a short period of time, but they still weren't giving a driver's license back to, I think, probably an 87-year-old at that time. Um, but he found ways around. Now, Bill was on top of all of the trends. I know this has been said, um, but before any of you had an air fryer, Bill had an air fryer. And Bill uh, invited me over for lunch one time and made us grilled cheese, and that was the best grilled cheese sandwich I've ever had um, to this date. Apparently, he had a whole um, closet full of small appliances, um, but that's because he spent a significant amount of time at Home Depot um, talking to Kayla in the appliance department. <laughs> and she was very good at her job. Um, <laughs> Bill, Bill held court at Home Depot. Um, Bill had a long career in the construction industry and had a lot to offer. He spent a lot of time with Rob at McKee Homes. And when he was done at McKee Homes talking with Rob, he would come over to my office and visit with Cindy and Donna, and usually reminding them that I owed him a phone call or a visit or something of the sport. We were part of his uh, daily trip in the community, I would say. I learned a lot from my friend Bill. I have so many stories to share. He was part of my family. And he left a big mark on my life and the future of this province. I know he lived for 91 years and his passing shouldn't be a shock, but it was to me. And I know I'm not alone. But Bill will really be missed. Now, I was in attendance at Dot's funeral, and it was kind of a roast about Bill. <laughs> As this is somewhat shaping out to be, um, but I know he would like it a little bit spicy. So I encourage you to share your stories about Bill. Now, as we say to members that have passed in the Alberta Assembly, rest eternal, Grant unto him, O Lord, and let let perpetual shine upon him. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, Angela. It's very kind of you. And uh, yeah, um, big part of dad's life, so. It's good that she was able to make it, and I'd like to thank all the other progressive conservative people that helped out uh, with some of the signs and different things that uh, we asked them to do, and Angela really helped us to find this venue and different things like that. So some of these political people, I guess, aren't so bad. <laughs> Anyhow, that's my rant on politics. Uh, maybe what we can do is ha get back into some family people and we'll get Andrea and Jeremy to come up. I think Andrea's got uh, a few things she'd like to say. I'm not sure if Jeremy's going to say much, but he's kind of their support. So I was going to raise the podium, but Andrea's even shorter than me, so I don't I think heels. we need... Oh, she's got heels, so I can raise the podium. There, look at that. <laughs> Now I gotta do the tech support. Mm. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> okay, this is if I miss break yeah. it down. All right. <coughs> All right. So, my name is Andrea, and um, my grandfather was 
was Bill Forrest. This is my brother, Jeremy, who we were asked to come up and say a few words today. And truthfully, I struggled and procrastinated with writing this um, forever because I still feel like he's going to come through those doors anytime and tell us all. <laughs> Not good, guys. I got two pages. Um, you, okay. Tell us all to stop crying. <laughs> he would tell us all to stop crying and get on with our day. It's interesting listening to the stories of Grandpa. For our whole lives, we've been told stories of Grandpa from when he was working in BC on the trains, raising kids in the Okanagan, and the project management days of Ontario and Vancouver. We had the privilege of seeing Grandpa through a different lens than many of you in this room today. He had a huge impact on who we are today. It always felt like Jeremy and I had two sets of parents. In our younger days, we would spend our weekends and summers with Grandma and Grandpa. In the 90s, when we lived in Ontario, we spent most weekends exploring the small towns around Georgetown and all over, over southern Ontario. As we got older, Grandma and Grandpa moved to Vancouver. It felt like our whole world had changed with them being so far away. We really missed our grandparents. The solution was clear to my parents, and I appreciate it so much more now that I have children myself. Jeremy and I would fly to Vancouver and spend the majority of our summers with them there. We, starting at ages at 8 and 10, would get on a plane by ourselves in Toronto and be so excited to see Grandpa's smiling face waiting for us to arrive in Vancouver. It was the best part of our year, and we had the privilege of doing it with them for 10 years. <sighs> For a whole six weeks, we could be found roaming around BC and sometimes Alberta in the white Toyota Corolla. The summers were so special. They felt like pure, pure, they felt like pure freedom away from mom and dad. <laughs> Sorry. Little did I know at the time how hard grandpa had worked to get us out there, fly us out there, plan and finance our fun trip. These trips instilled a love of travel and adventure and exploration that I still have today. As a parent myself now, I try to give my kids the same experience because he taught me that there's nothing like the joy and wonder when it comes to exploring a new place for the first time, and bonus points if it was in nature. Our summer adventures always included family, aunts, uncles, cousins, great aunts, second cousins twice removed, and people that I now know I'm actually not really related to. <laughs> It didn't matter. Family and the feeling of belonging was at the core of who he was. And above all else, he wanted to keep the Forrest family close. As I look around the room today, he clearly succeeded. He was passionate about making sure we were all connected. And I believe his work in this area will have the most lasting impact with these tight bonds that will last generations to come. Grandpa always wanted to show us special places in nature. Fishing on Vancouver Island was his favorite summer excursion. He truly was in his own element among the forest and water. It brought out his playful side. One of my favorite memories is of him leaping from log to log while we were fishing on the dock in Bamfield. We all held our breath as he jumped between the unstable logs in his 60s. But even in his 60s, he never lost his footing and was quite nimble. I'm grateful that he was so healthy for so long throughout his life because as he got older, my children got to know him. And it means so much more to me that my kids will remember him and think of him when stories are shared with our family. As it's been mentioned, he wasn't the grandpa who was quick to hug or say I love you, but we always knew grandpa would be there for us. He was my first call if I needed help or advice and he gave the best pep talks. If I was considering a bad choice, his answer would always be, no need to make a decision today, this late in the day. Best to sleep on it, and then you have the whole day tomorrow to decide. And I'm sure he was the first call of many people in this room. That's just who he was. He was a supporter of so much and so many. This became more evident as I grew older. He was a person who helped me move into my dorm in university. He would drive all the way in from Airdrie to pick me up to help me escape the dorm life in Calgary. And he was the person who proudly helped me move out of university after I graduated. Even later in my life, 
a whole truck full of wedding supplies needing to be delivered to northern, very remote, northern Vancouver Island and back. No problem, he was on it. He even installed the windows in my house at the prime age of 80. Thanks, Uncle Doug, for the backup on that one. <laughs> we are so lucky to have been so close to Grandpa for so much of our lives. And we are hopeful that we will be able to pass down the many lessons that he has shared with us. We love you, Grandpa. Thank you. I love you and I miss you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, we like to call Andrea the golden child and Jeremy was the bronze child. <laughs> they got to do a lot with mom and dad and that was really great that they were able to get out and do that kind of stuff. Dad always took pleasure in that and, and, and so did mom. Mom just used to love it. So uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's been really, really nice. And you know, dad had so many different sayings, you know, this and that. and. You know, he always used to say this and that, and oh boy, like it was just the way he would go on with some of that stuff. But everybody remembers some of that, and he would always be able to take one day at a time or whatever it was to kind of give you a bit of time to think about the decision that you were going to make and make sure that you were on the right track. Um, anyhow, um, yeah, be sorely missed for sure. There's a few other people in the crowd that uh, got to know Dad many years ago, and um, there's a gentleman when Dad moved back to Airdrie that really kind of helped Dad get back involved in, in some, some service and stuff like that, and I'd like to call him up today, and, and I know he used to go over and visit with Mom and Dad quite a bit, and uh, maybe, Ed, if you wouldn't mind coming up and saying a few words. Well, good day. I can only see half you, but uh, yeah, I met uh, I met Bill a couple of decades ago when I was going through a pretty rough time myself. And uh, <clears throat> like most of the, his family had said, what a, you know, he was a uh, he didn't he didn't show kindness really really well, <laughs> and he didn't show it to me either. So one of the first things that I did, I was going through a bit of a rough time. I, I had got promoted at work, and I really wasn't qualified for the job, and the money was really good, so I took the job. <clears throat> so I went over to him to talk about that, and I, I was really nervous and scared to get things out of my chest, so I, I went in, I sat down, and first thing happened, Dorothy made a pot of tea, and we sat down, and... Uh, drank the tea, and Dorothy and I watched the uh, Blue Jays ball game. I never did talk to Bill. <laughs> <coughs> so, that's a true story. Uh, <laughs> and then, actually, I became pretty good friends with Dorothy before we really became pretty good friends with Bill. <laughs> because we would lots of, watch a lot of Blue Jay games. And she wasn't shy either. She would tell you that that coach got to go. And, uh, and was always part of, of the conversations that I would have with Bill. So I'm an avid golfer, and they back onto the golf course. So Bill knew when I was golfing, and he would make sure he'd be out in his yard in the backyard when I would walk by, and I'd come over and we'd have a chat. I'd go play my round of golf, and lots of times I'd go in and I'd sit down. And... Uh, tell him how, how tough life was. <laughs> and he would tell me, <laughs> just like was mentioned a couple of times, you know, uh, get on with it. <laughs> and, uh, and then, yeah, so uh, Bill was a friend, a friend of another Bill, Bill Wilson, and so am I. And for the longest time, Bill and I would... Uh, try to keep things together at a uh, couple of different groups. And uh, 
And he, sh he taught me a lot and learned me a lot about, you know, how to treat people. And that uh, one, night, <laughs> one night he said, Ed, Ed, I got a live one. I'll pick, come and pick me up. So I picked him up and went over and we picked up a gentleman on the front, on his front step. His wife had kicked him out and all he had was a bag of, bag of clothes. Well, Eddie's not coming to my house, and he said, he, he said, I know Laurie ain't letting him in yours, so. So let's put him in a hotel for the night, and he says, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll check on him in the morning. So away we go over like that, and I had a few, so I gave Bill half the cash, half the money for the hotel, and Bill went in and put the rest of it on his credit card. And he came out in the car and said, okay, that should do it. I said, Bill, uh, how did, you, how did you pay that? He said, well, I gave my credit card. I said, so you just picked up a guy that you don't know off a front step with a bag of clothes and you just put him in a hotel with your credit card number. You know he can room service, you know. Stop the car. <laughs> he went back in and he sorted that out. <laughs> now, now that, happened, that happened more than once. So Bill would help anybody at any time, and he would go to any length. I remember us getting in the car, driving, for, driving to Red Deer to help somebody, just to, you know, because a person needed help. Now, that wasn't something that I would have done at that particular time in my life. But later on in life, I understood why he did it. And... Uh, and that's when my life started to change. A couple of other things about Bill that you guys probably don't know. He doesn't talk about uh, that part of his life very much, nor did he with me. I feel I know Angela better than most of you guys <laughs> because our conversations would definitely lead to the Conservative Party. And uh, I'd like to say he convinced me to be a conservative, but I was already a conservative before he got to me. <laughs> so, Angela, thank you for what you said. And he became a big part of my life, too. You know, and uh, it, it, it's not fair in a lot of things. You know, a lot of things that we do, it's just not fair. Life's just not fair. That he, he would tell me to get on with it, you know. And a lot of times, a lot of times, you know, uh, as strong as some of us, some of us think we are, you know, we're just human. And that's what I saw with him. He was human, and he was kind, but rough as nails. But he wouldn't let me away with anything. <laughs> and I guess that's what's most important to me. And I, I know, like. I met Bill approximately around, I'm going to say 2004, but I, I really don't know when it was, right? But we became pretty close really quick. And I know there's an awful lot of people in this room, because I see them here, that went to Bill's house, and, and, and I bet everybody was, was as welcome as I was. You know, the fact that Dorothy and I had a little thing, but that was, that was all about sports. <laughs> And, uh, and the other thing that was, uh, that was really particular funny, he says, Dorothy and I watched the, would watch a Blue Jay game on many occasions, and after the game was over, he said, well, what did you want to talk about? I said, Bill, I don't know. <laughs> and, and we would have a lot of laughs, and we would talk about an awful lot of stuff, but no matter what the subject was, it would always get around to Angela and the TC party. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Ed and I have known each other for a fair number of years, and I hate to say it, but Ed's a Boston Bruins fan, and I'm a Montreal Canadiens fan, as everybody knows, and I don't know, it must have been 10 years ago. We haven't been in the playoffs for a long time, but... Uh, Montreal took out Boston one year, and so I called him, and I told, I told, uh, told him it was a collect call from Carey Price, and he hung up on me right away, just like right click, and 
I'll never forget that. But he, yeah, we just always, sometimes he'll come and, and he'll be wearing all Boston stuff. And he'll take off a uh, hoodie and there's a Boston sweatshirt. And then take off the Boston sweatshirt. There's a Boston t-shirt. It's like, come on. <laughs> it's getting offside. Anyhow, I'm going to call up Dad's brother, Uncle Bob, and Uncle Bob has agreed to say a few things that we probably don't know too much about because he grew up with Dad. So, Uncle Bob, if you don't mind coming up. It's a tough crowd to follow on. I... Uh, I've heard all your stories about Bill and how he didn't show his love and all those things. And uh, You should have met our father. <laughs> I don't think Dad ever told any of us that he loved us. Just It's not in the forest gene. I don't know about the younger ones. but uh, Anyway, I'd like to, t to speak about how we grew up. As you know, my name is Bob. I am one of Bill's brothers. Our family consisted of seven children, four boys, and three girls. And sadly, only four of us are left. We were raised in a small town in, in southeastern Saskatchewan, and our home did not have electricity or running water. We did have a coal-fired furnace in our dugout basement, and a wood-fired stove with a water reservoir for hot water. And I tell you, that once a week bath with the big round tub in the middle of the floor was not the greatest, <laughs> especially if you were one of the younger ones, which I am. Uh, but we always had enough to eat, as living on a farm, you grew your own vegetables and you raised your own stock. So. That was never a problem. As I am seven years younger than Bill, I do not have a lot of memories while on the farm. By the time I was old enough to remember, he had gone to boarding school in a town approximately 30 miles away, which in those days was a long way. And yes, white kids went to boarding school. We, we connected Years later, when the family moved to Calgary, where Bill, who was now married to Dorothy, lived, he worked for the CPR and got me a job there and the fantastic sum of $250 a month. You can imagine, as a 16-year-old kid, I was in high hog heaven or whatever. We also spent a lot of time together at Bonspiels in small towns around Calgary. Later, Bill and his family moved to BC where his problem with alcoholism occurred, or continued, I'm not sure which. We did not have a lot of interact interaction together until he moved to Prince George when we again connected. We both worked for the same company. He, he is manager in Br Prince George, and I was in Calgary. Unfortunately, Mr. Trudeau Sr. brought in his fantastic Kill Alberta policy which caused the company to go bankrupt, leaving both of us out of our jobs. Bill went east to the Toronto area, and my wife, Karen, and my family went west to Vancouver. Later, we re reconnected in Vancouver after he and Dorothy came west, and finally they moved to Airdrie where we would visit. After Dorothy's passing, we spent more time conversing by phone. Fortunately, we had similar ideas on life, liberty, and politics. Otherwise, it would not have been very friendly. As I am sure you know, Bill was not shy on voicing his opinions. Uh, I guess I'm not either. However, he was always ready to follow up on his opinions with actions, which very few of us do. My brother lived his life to his fullest. He had a humble beginning and troubles during his life but he overcame all of these with the help of his remarkable wife, Dorothy, for the betterment of society. His legacy is his remarkable family and his many friends. Rest in peace, Bill. We will miss you.
Thank you. Well, we weren't sure if we were going to get them up. We couldn't seem to get any of the brothers to come up. But uh, thank you, Uncle Bob, for coming up and saying a few words, some of the stuff that I forget about. I remember there was a story years ago. We always talk about it. And I think it might have been Uncle Bob up in the barn, up in the hayloft, and they were throwing rocks. And Dad threw a rock and hit somebody in the forehead, and he fell out of the, the hayloft onto the ground. And so... It was never, uh, I don't know exactly how the story goes, but hopefully afterwards when we're having a few snacks or whatever, somebody can find out the true story on that one because I'm not sure if it was Uncle Bob or Uncle Lass or who it was that got hit in the head with the rock, but I'm pretty sure it was Dad probably throwing the rock. So, uh, Yeah, that was a bad one too. There's a cat story as well with the cat getting the tail pulled off, the hair off of the tail. So you can imagine. And I think once, I don't know who it was that was holding the cat, but I wouldn't want to be the guy holding the cat. when the t Who was it? <laughs> so yeah, that's quite the story. I don't know how they get away with it. You wouldn't get away with that nowadays. That'd be inhumane or something. There's too many sensitive people out in the world nowadays. Uh, yeah, Dad had the knife, yeah. Well, Dad always seemed to be the lucky guy, not taking the injury. Anyhow, we have a gentleman here today that uh, he used to come and sit around our table when I lived in Prince George. I was about 15 or 16 doing a lot of crazy things out there in the world, and uh He'd come and sit with mom and dad, and it, it was getting really monotonous. He was always there. It was almost like he was moving in or something. But we, every once in a while, we get to see him again, and he's come today. I think he's in Cologne now or something. But anyhow, come on up, Mitch, and say a few words about dad, if you don't mind. You can leave that chair there. Don't worry. I'll raise the thing for this guy. Because Carlos spent, got this nice podium for everybody. I did move in, actually. It was amazing. <clears throat> I suppose this, uh, this is a moment in life that you know is inevitable, but you hope never really comes. I've heard some amazing shares here today that have really uh, captured the essence of who Bill was, and he was an incredible uh, human being, one that I know I too will, will surely miss. Um, my honey and I would like to extend our condolences to the entire Forrest family, and we appreciate this opportunity to be able to be here and share in this, this special moment, you know. I've known uh, Bill and Dot's family for going on 47 years now, and uh, I love and respect every one of them. And they've been an integral part of my life. I think to say that uh, Bill and Dot were instrumental in, in helping save my life might, might be a bit of an understatement, but uh, you know, there's, um, those are moments and times that I will cherish and will be eternally grateful for. I think uh, the entire family has uh, played a part and, and helped determine who I am these days, I've heard people say that up here, you know, that, uh, that they're all very helpful and always putting their hands out to help others. And, and I was one of those others, I, uh, you know. And for me, it all started with Bill. You know, I met Bill at a time in my life where I needed some, some guidance and direction. And uh, he opened up his heart and his home and his family. And, uh, you know, I, I never looked back. I think Bill was probably one of the wisest men I ever knew, and uh, he certainly wasn't, as everybody has said, shy on telling you how he thought life should be. Uh, but it's through his teachings and, and his sayings that uh, I managed to forge a bit of a life of my own. And I can only hope that uh, I can have the impact on someone else's life that, that he had on mine. You know, I think that's probably 
the one thing that Bill would hope is that we would pass this on, you know. So it, um, it's, it's an emotional time. And certainly I, I don't know that I was a, a, as emotional as I am now when I first came in here, I got to tell you. But I'm looking at these pictures and I'm listening to the stories. And my God, it's just, you know, so many things I could, I could share and, and tell you about. What's ironic, though, is my relationship with Bill started off as this tiny little man that used to annoy the shit out of me. And uh, he knew how to push my buttons. Oh, my God. You know, and I wanted to come across the table and just throttle him so many times. But the thing was, is he was right, you know. And that even pissed me off more. But that went from that relationship to a relationship of respect, admiration, and love in a very big hurry. It um, is a moment in my life that I will never soon forget. You know, I've heard so many people up here <clears throat> sharing stories, and that wasn't my intention when I got here. I thought I was going to keep this short and sweet, and it still might be short and sweet compared to what already gone on here. I mean, it's hard to keep up with Dougie, as we've all, he, he would attest to. Yeah. Uh, but stories. <laughs> One that comes to mind is, is Bill and Dot both loved fishing. And we went on numerous, numerous fishing trips, although the fishing trips he took me on also involved me having to chop a shitload of woods for his house so that he could use it in that wood stove. I, and I was the only one of all the boys in that family that was doing that. I, you know, hey? And they'd sit and laugh like a bugger because, oh, dad's got another sucker, you know, like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. But um, there's this one fishing trip and it involved crossing a small creek and uh, I can't remember, I'd carried somebody across this creek and Bill was up the top with a chainsaw, of course, you know, it was the wood aspect. And uh, Dot was down the bottom and she was halfway through this creek. And all of a sudden, I hear the chainsaw fire up. And all of a sudden, out of the bush, shoots this great big black bear. And he's headed straight for Dot. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, okay, what do you do? So I stand there and I yell, get out of there, you miserable bitch. You know? And Dot looks at me and stops and says, I'm slow, but there's no reason to talk to me like that. I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> and this bear got right up beside her and shot down the creek. And out of the woods comes Bill with that annoying little laugh he had and just laughing his ass off, eh? But that was Bill. It was the best fishing trips I have ever been on. You know, just amazing. So, I have a multitude of stories, uh, memorable moments that I could share. But selfishly, I'm not going to. I'm going to keep them all right here. And I'm going to reflect on them like I usually do. And remember a man and a family and his wife that were like my second parents. And I take great comfort in knowing that Bill and Dot are together again, having that cup of tea that Carrie talked about. And I take even greater satisfaction in knowing that they're accompanied by two other people that are incredibly meaningful to me my father and my father-in-law, and may they all rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mitchell. Uh, really nice that he was able to come out today. He's not good at answering his phone, but he did manage to get back to us and let us know that he was going to come. So, um, Another fellow that's not too good at answering his phone is Grant, and he was one of the guys that kind of came into our lives a um, little later in Airdrie here, and, and uh, 
he's he's been a real miracle you might say dad dad kind of told him that he didn't think he had a chance but that he would try and help him and anyhow I'll let you guys decide for yourself uh, he's in BC now but uh, so he's a bit of a tree hugger but uh, anyhow uh, that nothing against the, all you people that came from BC but that's what we call you anyhow <laughs> maybe it's just me that calls you that Anyhow, Grant, would you like to come up and say a few words? <laughs> I guess we can put this down now a little bit for Grant. Hello, everyone. Um, as Doug was saying, I met Bill uh, when I was 59. I think Bill was about 77 at that time. It would be about 14 years ago. And uh, I was looking for hope. And I was looking for answers. And the day I met Bill, he very clearly let me know that he didn't see much hope. <laughs> and he certainly did not have the answers. Uh, that was the beginning of the relationship that I cherish. Uh, 14 years later, I have a life and a family and, a, and an extended family as well. I, uh, I quickly felt that I had been adopted into the Forrest family, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. My parents had passed away years ago. Um, it was perfect timing, perfect timing for me. I... I think one of the things that Bill taught me was about the silence. Now, I, I've heard a lot of stories about Bill being uh, crusty and opinionated. I think you guys busted that, those edges off of him by the time I met him. He, uh, I found him a very kind and gentle guy. Oh, yeah, he wasn't all about hugging and so on, but when he looked in my eyes, he was looking at me. He wasn't looking past me, he was looking into me. And it always made me a little nervous of what he was really seeing. Um, but our, our relationship grew over the years. And uh, what can I say about a man who provided me a blueprint, solid and true, a blueprint to live life by, and uh, it, it wasn't something he gave me. He told me, he showed me where to look for it. He would say, have you prayed? Have you read the book? That's where your answers are. And, uh, you know, that information sees me through today. It's, uh, I feel quite sad about Bill's passing. I was fortunate to spend a few days with Bill prior to him going into the hospital, and what can I say? He didn't change from the first day I met him to the last. And, you know, that, that, that's a credit. That's a credit to a life well lived, you know, life of meaning and purpose. And I don't know that I would be here today had I not met Bill. But I am, and we are, and Bill would want us all to keep doing. Thank you. Thank you, Grant. Grant's become a good friend, and we got to go out for dinner uh, right before uh, Dad did go into the hospital, and so it was really nice that Grant was able to make it at that time. You know, it's... Amazing how God works in our lives, in my opinion, you know. He got to come out just before, so. And I don't know if that was Dad trying to make sure or what it was, but anyhow, I, I really did enjoy that time that we went for dinner. It was Chinese food. My dad never used to eat Chinese food when Mom was around, but then he started doing it, and it was like, wow, that's kind of crazy. He even ate spaghetti, too. Like, what the? Right? Like, he would never eat stuff like that, but... Anyhow, mom, mom treated him too good, I guess. But um, 
couple things, uh, like I said, there's going to be some food and snacks and stuff afterwards, and, um, you know, uh, if anybody wants to come up to the mic and say a few words afterwards or whatever, that's more than welcome if, if I didn't call anybody. Um, I'm not sure that I've got everybody. There is one person that wanted to go last, and I said, yeah, okay, I'll allow it, but uh, Peter... Would you want to come up and say a few words? No? Okay, well, sorry for your luck. I'll put it down for you, too, because it's too high for you. I like this thing. This is great. Thanks, Carlos. Got your speech? Thank you. Oh, wow, it is pretty hard to see everybody down here. Anyway, starting off, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and uh, making the trip, and obviously it's, a, it's an effort to get here, and anybody that had a hard time finding the place here, thank, thankfully you made it. Um, basically, as Doug was saying, I, I came here for the last, basically, number of years for Dad, and for the fast, last five years that Dad lived on his own, missing Mom, but continuing to live life on his own terms. The daily paper, emails were read to him, he had it all set up on his computer, and he had his Kobo books and everything else as well. So everything was read to him, as his eyesight, as you heard, was not very good, and his hearing wasn't very good at all. And that was basically the reason why they took his license away. The, the Staples geeks and the eye doctor helped to ensure that he could access information and be informed and send replies. As uh, we heard before, Dad called it, instead of COVID, it was always Covis. Everything was Covis. And the Covis era did kind of cramp his style a little bit because he didn't really care for the Zoom calls. He couldn't cut people off and do things like that. <laughs> but that said, he didn't miss a beat. We still went to the gym. We went to the farmer's market, Walmart, Co Costco. <laughs> Dad loved to shop. <laughs> and he shopped, let me tell you. <laughs> what did you say, Doug? Five credit cards? Six credit cards? <laughs> But he never went through the cashier. He always went through the self-checkout. And he could never read that little screen. And it would always be on there. Would you uh, donate $2? Would you do this? Would you like this? And he used to get so pissed off because he used to have to get the pre people to come over and push the numbers in for him if I wasn't there. As you've heard, Dad also loved gardening. He spent time digging, planting, sorting, watching the weather for hail and re was rewarded most years with many varieties of flowers, manicured lawn, fresh vegetables. Dad was a meat and potatoes guy, like Doug said. He never ate pizza, and he never wore blue jeans. If gardening was not discussed, as you heard, politics probably were. If anybody in this room is an NDPer, can you put your hand up? <laughs> I don't see any hands. And no brave people here. The local UCP would fill his time with leadership, reviews, elections, policy debates, meetings, were at his house, as you heard. Dad looked forward to discussing his points of view with anybody, and history lessons were free. There were two cats during this period of time. Annie, who was the meanest, nastiest cat you ever had ever come across. But unfortunately, Dad had to put her down. It was a very, very sad Dad day, and Dad always used to say, you can't let animals suffer. So he went and he decided to get another one. He adopted Mitzi, or Missy, whatever you wanted to call her that day. Uh, and when it, and the kitten, kitten was adopted, and, and the day that was very sad for me was the day that I had to give her away. Both gats were loved, spoiled, and very overweight. Whenever I left my RV at the house, Dad always used to say, make sure you leave the keys with me. And I used to say, why? He says, if the house catches fire, at least I can move your motorhome out to a safer spot. Grandson Kirk would come over and help download computer programs, complete typing. Diana would also come and help with the typing and do all the scheduling for Dad and make sure he was on time for meetings and generally had a good idea what was going on. The Genesis Center, 
uh, welcome dad because he was over 80 and dad always liked to brag that because he was over 80 he didn't have to pay any fees and it was free. We met a lot of good people there. Uh, dad enjoyed going to the gym. He looked forward to going to the gym and the doctor said it was one of the best things that he could ever have done. So we were very happy with that. In saying all of this, along with the Woodside Seniors people and the other people that are mentioned and all of most of you folks here, that's really what that kept Dad young. And he was pretty young up until that last day when we took him to the hospital. In saying that, when we were going through all of this stuff in his uh, man cave, computer room, or whatever you wanted to call it, I came across this thing that uh, was an old European saying about William. And its meaning is guardian. It says that it's a distinguished, good-natured, intelligent, hardworking, in other words, an organized, reliable man. That was my dad. Thank you all. Okay, in saying that, um, Carlos, I don't know if we can maybe start to wheel some of these things out and get that kind of stuff organized. And in the meantime, maybe we can, if there's anybody that would like to come up and say a few words or whatever, we can do that as well. Um, you know, the one thing that I would like to end with on my part of things is um, it's a saying that I like to, to use, and it's, uh, you know, we're born and we die. It's what we do in between that counts. And for my dad, he helped a lot of people and did a lot of good things. And he did some shitty things in, in his life as well. But he's really, I believe he's in a better place. And he earned his place in that place, you know. And, uh, you know, I think that we can always redeem ourselves, even though we've there's some things that we've done probably that we don't really like about ourselves but and dad used to talk about that and you know one story he used to tell was that he was sitting up on a hilltop and he just couldn't figure out why his life was going like that because he knew he was probably the second smartest guy in the world and you know and and there was no clearly no humility there but anyhow um and he just couldn't figure it out and that's when he went down and mom kind of straightened about. So, you know, uh, I hate to say it, but to all the women out there, you know, thank you for standing beside us men and directing and guiding us because I don't know where I'd be today without some of the women in my life. So anyhow, thank you very much. If anybody else has something that they'd like to come up and say, you're welcome to do that. And if not... Uh, Hopefully we can hang out and, and shoot the shit, as I like to say, for a bit and, and just have some snacks and remember Dad the way he was. Thank you.
Hello, folks. If you, if I can have your attention for just one second, this is Carlos back in the back here. If you would like to eat in the theater, that is fine. If you would like to sit at a table, you may go through the doors to the left here, to my left, into the dance studios, and there's a lot of tables set up. You can sit there and have a little more, more privacy.